we now know that the atom is actually made up of smaller subatomic particles, the proton, neutron, and electron. Furthermore, we know that it's the different combinations of these particles that ultimately determine the properties of the atom and the elements. In this PowerPoint, we'll explore the properties of these particles and how they combine in different atoms. We'll also discuss how atomic notation can be used to indicate these different combinations. So the three most important characteristics of these particles are their masses, their relative charge, and their locations in the atom. The masses I have listed here in two different units, grams and AMU. The first is the unit that we're most familiar with, and you can see from these values that the particles are incredibly tiny, times 10 to the negative 24 grams. Now these aren't easy numbers to actually deal with, so we usually convert them into units of AMU. An AMU stands for an atomic mass unit, and one AMU is defined to be exactly 1.6605 times 10 to the negative 24 grams. So when we convert each of our subatomic particle masses into units of AMU, this means that the proton is approximately one AMU, a little bit larger. The neutron is also a little bit larger than one AMU, and the electron is much smaller, a fraction of one AMU. The second property you should be familiar with is electrical charge. Now charge is a fundamental property of matter. Particles can be positively charged, negatively charged, or neutral. And charged particles exert forces on each other. Oppositely charged particles, such as protons and electrons, attract each other. And like charges, such as two electrons, repel each other. You can measure the magnitude of charge using coulombs. And you can see that in coulombs, the protons are the exact opposite in charge compared to the electrons. Positive 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs versus negative 1.602 times 10 to the 19th. Now again, these numbers are not the easiest to deal with. These are pretty small numbers. And it really is just the relative charge of protons to electrons to neutrons that is the most important. So rather than uh, talking about charge in terms of coulombs, we usually talk about it in terms of relative charge, which would be plus one for the proton, zero or neutral for the neutron, and minus one for the electron. And finally, these particles have unique locations within the atom. Both the proton and neutron can be found in the nucleus of the atom, while the electron orbits in the space outside the nucleus. This brings up some interesting space and mass relationships for the atom. The proton and neutrons in an atom make up most of the mass. Electrons really are just a fraction of the overall mass of the atom. So these large massive particles are crammed into a nucleus, which occupies a fraction of the space of the atom. If the diameter of an atom is on the order of 10 to the negative 10 meters, then the diameter of the nucleus is 10 to the negative 15 meters. Let's put this into a scale that's easier to visualize. If we were to blow up that nucleus to the size of a blueberry, the atom itself then would be the size of a football field. So the vast majority of the space occupied by the atom is defined by the position of those tiny electrons, while the mass of the atom is determined primarily by the number of protons and neutrons crammed into that tiny, tiny nucleus. So the number of subatomic particles in an atom determine the major properties of the atom. First, the number of protons is known as the atomic number, and it is uniquely associated with the identity of the atom. For example, every atom that contains one proton has an atomic number of one, is an atom of hydrogen, and has all the properties of that particular element. If we were to increase the number of protons in the nucleus to two, so an atomic number of two, then the identity of the atom would actually switch to helium. And now all of the properties of that particular atom correspond to those of the element helium.
And we can keep going up, adding more protons and changing the identity of the atom to different elements and changing the properties of that atom to those of that element. So increase the number of protons to three, atomic number three, and we have an atom of lithium. Increase it to 10, and we have an atom of neon. Each element on the periodic table has a unique atomic number that indicates the number of protons found in every atom of that element. If you change the number of protons in the atom, you change the identity of the element. So the sum of the number of protons and neutrons is known as the mass number. This is not quite the same as the actual mass of the atom but it gives us a whole number approximation of the mass. So for this atom of hydrogen, we have one proton and zero neutrons. So one plus zero gives us a mass number of one. For this atom of helium, we actually have two protons and two neutrons. We add those two together to get a mass number of four. And we can keep doing that. So for lithium, we've got three protons and three neutrons. Add those together, it gives us a mass number of six. And the neon is 10 protons plus 10 neutrons, which gives us a mass number of 20. It is possible for atoms of the same element to have different numbers of neutrons. These are called isotopes. So these are atoms that will have the same atomic number or elemental identity because they have the same number of protons, but different mass numbers because they have different numbers of neutrons. So this graphic shows you three common isotopes of hydrogen. The most common is sometimes referred to as protium or hydrogen one. It's hydrogen because it contains one proton in that nucleus. It also has zero neutrons, which means it has a mass number of one, hence hydrogen one. The second most common is called deuterium or hydrogen two. So again, it is still hydrogen because it has only one proton in that nucleus, but now it also has a neutron, which increases the mass number to two, hence hydrogen two. And last, we have the heaviest isotope, which is also known as tritium. And tritium has one proton, making it hydrogen, but two neutrons, giving it the mass number of three. So tritium is actually an unstable isotope of hydrogen. It actually breaks apart over time. And it turns out that isotopes can have stable or unstable combinations of neutrons and protons. The unstable combinations actually will eventually break apart, um, and as they do so, they release energy. We also call these radioactive isotopes. They tend to be very rare compared to the stable isotopes of different elements. Finally, the balance or difference between the number of positively charged protons and negatively charged electrons in an atom gives us the net atomic charge. In a neutral atom with a net charge of zero, the number of protons equals the number of electrons. This is the case for each of the atoms represented here. The hydrogen, for example, has one positively charged proton in the nucleus and one negatively charged proton circling around the nucleus. The two charges balance each other out, giving us a net charge of zero. Or in terms of the formula, one proton minus one electron equals zero. It's the same thing for helium. Helium has two protons in the nucleus, two electrons circling around it. Two minus two gives you a net charge of zero. And we can do the same thing for lithium and neon. In these representations, we have the same number of protons as electrons, and we end up with a net charge of zero. So if the number of electrons and protons are not equal in an atom, then a net charge develops. We call charged atoms ions. This graphic shows how ions develop using hydrogen as an example. So a neutral atom of hydrogen is in the center and it contains one proton and one electron. The positive charge on the uh, proton balances out the negative charge on the electron. And we have a net charge of zero. If we were to remove that electron from the atom, 
we would end up developing a net positive charge overall. So using our charge formula, our one proton minus zero electrons, since we removed the electron, gives us a net charge of plus one. Positively charged ions are known as cations. If we were to go in the opposite direction and add an electron to our hydrogen atom, so that instead of one electron, we now had two electrons orbiting our nucleus, we would develop a net charge of negative one. So the charge would be one proton minus two electrons using our formula, one minus two equals negative one. Negatively charged ions are known as anions. The charge on an atom is a very important factor in how it interacts with other atoms or its chemical reactivity. Charged atoms only develop from the loss and gain of electrons, never the loss and gain of protons. This is a very important thing to know. If the number of protons were to change, we would change the identity of the atom. And ions are atoms that have the same identity as the neutral atom of that element, just a different net charge. So the different relationships between protons, neutrons, and electrons in any atom can be summarized in a shorthand called atomic notation. This notation used the element symbol as the base. And at three corners of the symbol, a different property of that atom related to those subatomic particles can be noted. In the lower left, we put the atomic number. The upper left is the mass number, and the upper right is the charge. Now, not all of these properties are represented all the time in atomic notation. So if we're interested in just chemical reactivity, you'll often see the element symbol written only with a charge number in the upper right. This is because it's charge that matters in terms of chemical reactivity. If we were primarily interested in isotopes or masses of the element, then you would probably have just the mass number noted in the upper left. And again, this is because it's the mass number that matters uh, for calculations of average atomic mass in dealing with isotope situations. Of all of these, atomic number is the one that we usually don't see. And this is because if you know the identity of the element from the element symbol, you know the atomic number. Every element of helium, every atom of helium has to have an atomic number of two. You may not know off the top of your head that the atomic number of helium is two, but you can easily look it up on the periodic table. So we can use atomic notation to determine the number of subatomic particles in any atom. Here I have atomic notation written out for three different atoms of sodium. And we're going to figure out the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in each of these. The number of protons is the easiest, because I know that the atomic number represented in the lower left-hand corner equals the number of protons. And I know that each one of these is actually sodium, which means that they each have the same number of protons and the same atomic number, which is 11. I also know that mass number equals the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Now I have slightly different mass numbers here. The first isotope has 23 for the mass number. The second and third have 24 for the mass number. I can take this formula for mass number and I can actually rearrange it to solve just for neutrons. So if mass number equals the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, I can isolate neutrons by subtracting out the number of protons from each side. On the right hand side, the number of protons will cancel out, leaving me with just neutrons. I can rearrange this a little bit and I get number of neutrons equals the mass number minus the number of protons. So using this rearranged formula, I can calculate the number of neutrons for each of these atoms. For the first atom, I have my mass number of 23 minus my atomic number, which is the number of protons, which is 11. So 23 minus 11 equals 12 neutrons.
I can do the same thing for the remaining two atoms, both with uh, mass numbers of 24. 24 minus 11 gives me 13 neutrons for each. In a similar fashion, I can use the charge to figure out the number of electrons in each of these atoms. I know that charge equals number of protons, represented by capital P here, minus the number of electrons, represented by the capital E. I can rearrange this formula algebraically to get number of electrons by itself on one side. And when I do that, I get number of electrons equals the number of protons minus the charge. So I can use this rearranged formula to calculate the number of electrons for each of these atoms. Now in the first two atoms, I actually have a charge of zero. I know this because there's nothing written in the upper right hand corner. If there's nothing written there, you can assume you're dealing with a neutral atom or an atom with a charge of zero. So I can plug this charge number into my rearranged formula and I get 11 for the number of protons minus zero equals 11. So I have 11 electrons, the same as my number of protons. And this makes sense because I know neutral atoms contain the same number of protons and electrons. They're balanced in terms of charge. It's the same exact situation for the second atom. There's nothing written in the upper right hand corner, so we have a charge of zero, and we end up with 11 electrons as well. Now in the third atom, I actually do have a charge. There's a plus sign written in that upper right hand corner. Now, if you run across a notation that just has a plus or a minus written in that upper corner, you can assume that that means plus one or minus one. If it meant plus two or minus two, it would say plus two or minus two. The only time we leave off the number in this type of notation is actually if that number is one for charge. So in this case, I have just a single plus. That means a charge of plus one. Substituting this into my formula for electrons, I get 11 minus plus 1, which is equal to 10. I have 10 electrons in this atom. 11 protons, 10 electrons. So in summary, atoms are made up of the subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. The different numbers and combinations of these particles in an atom determine the identity, the mass, and the charge of that atom. An atomic notation is a shorthand way of showing the relationships between these properties and the number of subatomic particles for any atom.